All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attending tonight. My name is Amanda Wallmeyer, and I am the local history librarian here at Johnson County Library. Uh, thank you for attending today's program, The Past is Prologue, Confronting the Legacy of Indian Boarding Schools. The Past is Prologue is a bi-monthly program offered by Johnson County Library, where we highlight topics that are often left out, glossed over, or misrepresented in our history books. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A engagement tool, and we will try to answer all of these at the end of the program. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available in the next two weeks and can be accessed on Johnson County Library's YouTube channel or on our website at jocolibrary.org forward slash events forward slash on demand. We would also like to begin today with a brief land acknowledgement. Our Johnson County Library locations stand on the ancestral and treated lands of Native American peoples, including the Kanza, Kaskaskia, Kickapoo, Osage, Peoria, Sioux, and Shawnee. We pay respects to all Indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, for their continuing presence in this land and the land where you may be joining us from tonight. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Eric Anderson. Eric is a citizen of the Potawatomi Nation and professor of history at Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas. He received his PhD from the University of Kansas in American History, specializing in American Indian education and the history of Haskell Institute, the forerunner of today's Haskell Indian Nations University. So now please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Anderson. Good evening, thank you, Amanda, and I appreciate the invite to come and speak with you all tonight. Thank you all for being here. I remember we set this up so long ago and I can't believe it's December. Um, my plan tonight is to speak to you for about 40 minutes, and then I'll leave 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Um, this is something that's very easy for me to talk about. Um, as Amanda mentioned, this is kind of the area that I have um, landed in, in, in terms of um, uh, where my passion is and um, kind of where my field of expertise is, although it's a very, very big topic. So when you look at this first screen and it says a brief history of boarding schools, that's exactly what it will be. Um, I'm going to look primarily at the foundations of the federal off-reservation schools for Native American youth. Um, and confine that to when those began in the 1870s, and then really look at the early history of Haskell um, pretty much in the late 19th century and a little bit of getting into the early 20th. So that's just to give you some context, and um, we'll go ahead and begin. So if you were a student or a visitor to Haskell uh, in this period, and this picture is from around 1910, 1915, um, this is how you would have entered the school. This would be the main entrance. And if you're familiar with the city of Lawrence, um, this would be looking south from about 23rd and Lennard Streets. And you can see over there on the right, um, the first building is the superintendent's house. And the superintendent is kind of like the Indian agent, I guess. Um, he's the guy in charge and pretty much what he said went. Um, beyond that, you begin to see some school buildings, dormitories, and other aspects of the, the early period when this was called Haskell Institute. Uh, here's another view, and it's, it's looking the other way. So this would be looking to the north, and you probably notice some things about the school at this point, and this is about 1894 or five. Um, the buildings, many of them are made from the, the natural limestone that's found in this area. It's very institutional looking, lots of right angles and um, lots of um, envisioning of what a school for Indians would look like through Western eyes. Um, it's also rather isolated from the Lawrence community at that time. 
Uh, if you drove by Haskell today, again, on 23rd Street, as, as I'm sure some of you have, uh, it's kind of right in the heart of things. But back when the school was founded <clears throat> in uh, 1884 and building up to that time as it was being erected, um, it was very much on purpose that it was set apart from the growing city of Lawrence. Um, it was a citizens of the town who gave over the land on uh, which Haskell Institute was built. Uh, and they saw themselves as being very progressive minded folks. Some things never change, I guess. Um, and they thought they were doing a really good thing in establishing a school for American Indians um, near to their community. Uh, but they really didn't want it um, right next to or within the city of Lawrence. Uh, so it's kind of held at arm's length. And I mentioned the superintendent kind of being like the Indian agent. And at this time, Haskell Institute is almost like a little self-contained Indian reservation. And there wasn't a lot of, um, let's say, daily interaction between the city and the school. So I want to... Um, dial back a little and figure out how we got to this place called Haskell. And um, some of you may have heard of this guy, uh, Richard Henry Pratt. Uh, as you can tell, he is a military uh, guy and he's uh, probably most famous for establishing this school at uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And Pratt uh, had experience during his active duty uh, working with some African-American troops uh, and some Cherokee troops during the Civil War. Uh, so he had experience with minority groups. Um, after uh, the war had ended, um, Pratt was assigned to take charge of some prisoners of war, Indian prisoners of war. Um, there'd been a, a pause on the Indian Wars throughout much of the Civil War period, but then it resumed again in the 1870s. And um, on the Southern Plains, the Red River War was raging in the early 1870s. And Pratt was given this assignment to be the warden, essentially, of prisoners, mostly um, Cheyenne, Kiowa, Comanche. And they were transferred to an environment very, very different from, from what they were accustomed to. Um, and they were uh, housed at Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida. And Pratt and his wife were kind of the primary people interacting with these mostly young men. And um, this is where something um, kind of dawned on him or changed in him. And it's something that was um, quite a bit different from um, the way that most people in mainstream America thought at the time. Pratt realized in his you know, daily kinds of uh, interactions with these uh, prisoners that, hey, a lot of what I've been told, maybe everything I've been told about Indians is wrong. Um, they're human beings. Um, they're like us. They're just different culturally. And because Pratt was a product of his time, um, he thought, you know, there's not a lot of value in these Indian cultures but they are valuable as human beings. This is not an entirely new notion, but Pratt is going to take it to a whole new level. Um, if we looked at the, the history of the 19th century and US Indian policy, a lot of it was shaped by warfare. Um, and as I said, you know, that pretty much dominated up until the Civil War period. With the intervention of the Civil War and 620,000 American deaths. Uh, I think the, the taste for warfare had um, been mitigated quite a bit, let's say. And um, US policy began to shift accordingly, uh, particularly with um, a group of people, uh, and Pratt could be counted as one of them, who came to call themselves or style themselves as uh, friends of the Indian. That's exactly what they called themselves. And they were mostly um, people on the East Coast where, of course, there weren't really any Indians left. And as they looked at what was happening out West, which was kind of a replay of what had happened decades earlier in the East, um, they began to sympathize with the plight of American Indian people. 
and to reconsider that these policies of warfare and removal and dispossession of land, um, you know, were um, out of step, um, and certainly um, that warfare wasn't going to be a solution, a permanent solution. Uh, and there are a lot of different aspects to that. But um, of course, I think they rightly believe themselves to be um, more humanitarian in their view of Indians um, because they saw that warfare, of course, was um, aimed at a total destruction of Native people. Um, kind of that old adage of William Tecumseh Sherman, the only good Indian's a dead one, that had been a, um, a line of thought that had dominated much of, much of 19th century uh, American Indian policy. And um, these reformers thought that the answer to what was perceived by most as the Indian problem, and I will use some finger quotations here, these are things that they actually said, um, the solution lie not in warfare, but in changing Indians culturally. And Pratt is really um, one of the people at the forefront of that. So um, his motto is kill the Indian and save the man. And what that really encapsulates is an idea of saving Indian lives, but divorcing them from their cultures. So it's a shift from essentially genocide to one of ethnocide. Um, but if you think about those two mottos, those two creeds, the only good Indian is a dead one, and Pratt's kill the Indian, save the man. Um, they're really kind of two sides of the same coin. They both reflect a type of warfare. You know, one is a physical um, destruction and elimination of Indian people. And Pratt's and other so-called friends of the Indians was an ethnocide. They were setting out to destroy the things that made Indian people culturally Indians. And, th and that would be um, the leading charge um, for most of the, the, the 50 or so um, year history of these boarding schools that were focused on assimilation. So they saw no value in native cultures and um, they set out to destroy it and or destroy those cultures. And in doing so, essentially they started a new kind of warfare and it's a warfare that was fought against Indian children. One of the people who's listening to um, Pratt and others like him is this guy, Dudley C. Haskell, who is the congressional representative for the district that um, included Lawrence. And he's also a pretty powerful politician um, beyond that uh, because he happens to be chair of the uh, House Committee on Indian Affairs. And um, Pratt is watching what excuse me, Haskell is watching what Pratt is doing. And Pratt has convinced the government to hand over to him some unused military barracks in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And it's there that he starts his school. It's not fully federally funded, but it is a federal project. And um, in the view of these, these reformers, um, it's a grand experiment. You know, to see if that so-called Indian problem can be solved along these new lines. Um, and Haskell um, is the place that the school in Lawrence comes to be named for. Um, originally, it was just called the Industri Indian Industrial Training School at Lawrence. Um, but when Haskell died, kind of suddenly, um, it was decided that the school should be renamed in his honor. And... Um, you know, probably not a lot of people know that. In fact, my many of my students are often surprised and they say, what? Our school is named for a white guy? And in fact, it is. Um, so Haskell is able, like any good politician, I guess, to um, make sure that some of the funding for the new schools that the government is going to create, based on Pratt's model at Carlisle, one of those schools will go to his home district. And so Haskell Institute, or as it soon comes to be known, is born. Um, Pratt opens his school at Carlisle in 1879. It's just five years later that um, 
Haskell opens. And it builds very much on the model that Pratt has established. And the model really is um, kind of three things. It's um, English, Christianity, and hard work, and kind of a Protestant work ethic, I guess you could say. Um, Pratt, because his school is not entirely federally funded, has to go out and gain support. Um, and he does that among the public, you know, giving lectures, making presentations, I guess, like I'm doing tonight, um, but also among the Indian tribes and trying to convince them that they need to send their children to his school. He doesn't have the full weight of the federal government behind him. Um, the schools that are established in his wake will. And so um, there's eventually a more compulsory aspect um, to that education. Pratt has to be a lot more inventive, and he's a master, I would say, of what we would call PR, public relations today. And he goes out um, to both Indians and non-Indian groups and tries to make this convincing case about what his experiment at Carlisle is all about and how it's going to civilize Indians. And so one thing that he does is he uses photographs to illustrate what he can do. When he goes to the Indian groups, he may use these eventually, but when he goes out at first, he has to make a case in different ways. He has to maybe explain to them, well, if you'd understood what was in the treaties, you wouldn't have lost your land. Pretty harsh, but it has some truth to it. Um, he's able to gain some support among um, Native communities um, who are living in very desperate conditions. The reservations are very poverty stricken. They are essentially prisons. Um, you can't, you know, come and go freely. Um, there are very few opportunities for any kind of social mobility. Um, and there um, are a growing number of both parents and young people um, who find some appeal in what Pratt is trying to sell. Now for those non-Indian groups, he um, really likes to use these kind of photographs to illustrate what it is he can do. And so here you have a Navajo student um, as he looked when he entered Carlisle and then after he's been there for four years. And you can see that there are some obvious changes, um, his clothing, his um, regalia, um, the amulets and things that he's wearing, his his long hair, those things have all been changed. I would also submit to you that I think Pratt's not really above using some trickery because how did he get this guy's skin to be uh, whitened a, a few shades, um, probably manipulating the photo uh, negatives. Um, but whatever his methods, um, he does find support in both Indian and non-Indian communities. And um, so Carlisle and the schools like Haskell that follow in its wake um, become part of this growing system of um, government Indian schools. And I know that you can't really read, you know, all of the, the writing on this map, but it gives you a sense of what's happening. And you can see Carlisle you know, way over there in the east and a few others. Most of the schools are located west of the Mississippi because that's where most of the Indians are. Um, there are three different types of schools that this map is showing. Um, the government doesn't suddenly get into Indian education um, because Pratt comes along. They've been doing some of that for a while, but they begin to have a very different focus um, after the establishment of Carlisle and schools like it. But there are kind of three tiers to this system. There are um, reservation day schools. Kids go to the schools during the day and they go home at night. Pratt and the Friends of the Indians are saying, no, no, that's 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 never going to solve the Indian problem because when they go back home, they're just like, in his words, you know, a, a pig returning to the wallow. They're going to be around the language, the ceremony, um, the culture of their people. And 
Pratt's idea and those other reformers' ideas is to make a break with the culture. There are also um, boarding schools that are on or near reservations. And kids will go there during the week and come home on the weekends because they're situated closely to home. They also can, you know, kind of more freely uh, leave and return as they please. They're allowed to go home for ceremonies and special occasions and things like that. Again, Pratt saying, no, that won't work. That won't solve the problem. If we really want to educate Indians to be like us, to be like Westerners, to be like white people, we have to remove them completely from the familiarity, familiarity of their surroundings. And so that's where this idea of the non-reservation Indian school, you know, really begins to take hold and the government really um, gets into that business, I guess you can say. And, you know, you can, you can pretty easily, I think, um, visualize, you know, how far away it is from where most of the Indian tribes are located to go to someplace like Carlisle, all the way out there in Pennsylvania. But even approximately speaking, a place like Haskell is pretty far removed. And Carlisle, I don't know if you can see it, has a little star next to it. And Haskell in Kansas has that little star next to it. And if you look at the the, the blow up there of Oklahoma, there's the Chilaco School, there's Genoa up in Nebraska, there's the Salem School in Oregon. And all told, there's about 25 of these elite boarding schools that are situated um, far from the reservations. And so that's asking a lot. Um, that is um, setting up a very different kind of landscape where now the schools, at least these non-reservation schools, are able to fully focus on a complete kind of stripping away of identity and uh, breaking with those traditions. And I guess I should have said this earlier, but you know, the terminology that's often used when thinking about what's happening here is a program or a process of Indian education. And that's really a misnomer because what's actually going on is a process or a program of re-education. Of course, Native people have their own ways of educating their children. And that's exactly what these new schools are dedicated to eradicating is that traditional education. So when students come to that um, a place like Haskell, thinking back to that arch I showed you at the beginning, you know, it kind of looks like, well, maybe it's not so bad, sort of welcoming. But, you know, what lies beyond the archway, and a lot of the schools have those, um, is a very foreign hostile environment um, to the young Native people who come there. And they're going to immediately face some of those changes like you saw in the picture of Tom, the pictures of Tom Tarlino there. They're going to get haircuts. And that has a spiritual um, component to, to shore the, the, the long hair. Um, they're going to have things taken away from them in terms of their clothing or maybe um, things that their parents gave them that were meant to safeguard them. Um, they're going to be thrown into a very cold institutional environment <clears throat> where they don't have um, that, excuse me, that safety, that familiarity of home. Um, and they're going to be compelled to learn very quickly you know, how to speak English only and how to adjust to a very military-like environment um, that is um, so very different than home life. And so if you look at a picture of Haskell, um, again, probably around the same time as that first one I showed you with the arch, um, you can see that the boys and the young men um, are um, in what are essentially army surplus uniforms, like West Point kind of uniforms. Um, the young ladies and the girls, um, they're not in military uniforms, but they are in um, a uniformity of dress. 
Um, this is an irony, I would say, because one of the things that the schools are trying to instill in the students is a sense of individuality because in a tribal way of thinking you don't focus on the individual you focus on the group so this is one of the many ironies of the boarding schools is that while individualism is being touted uh, in reality daily life um, is being um, meted out in a very institutional kind of way um, Pratt focused on the young and that also became the model for the schools. Um, the thinking is that um, just like with those those schools that in his mind are too close to home, um, you're never going to change the older people. So you need to focus on getting the younger generations. And you can see there's a fairly wide range of ages here. Um, when I look at this picture, I think about what would it be like for an Indian parent to see um, their children, um, their young men and boys, especially dressed in the uniform of what not very long before um, were those of the enemy. Um, I think that would be a pretty dramatic and shocking uh, kind of um, response that they would have. Um, that first picture that I showed you of the, the archway, um, I pointed out the superintendent's house. Um, we're looking the other direction here. So the archway would be kind of off beyond that stand of trees. And the superintendent's house would be um, kind of right there in the middle background. And then next to that on the left is uh, Hiawatha Hall. That's one of those natural limestone buildings. Um, it's still there. It's the oldest building on our campus. It's currently closed, um, but it's a daily reminder of the um, the old Haskell Institute for sure. And there's just a couple of more pictures um, of, of the military atmosphere of the school. Students' lives are very regimented, even though the girls aren't out there in cadet battal battalion formation. Um, everything is sort of run, um, you know, like a tight ship. It's according to the clock. Um, there are bells and whistles and things that signal it's time to do this. And um, that, too, is a very foreign concept uh, to people who did not live by clock time traditionally. Um, that, that picture on the bottom I like just because it gives you a panoramic view. And again, you can see Hiawatha Hall and the gazebo in the middle and, and some of those other buildings. Um, this picture here illustrates the um, the nature of this re-education in its um, focus on very young children. Um, you know, Pratt would say he's full of these aphorisms, and he would say something like, um, "You know, in order to um, civilize the Indian, get him into civilization, and um, keep him there until he's thoroughly soaked." And so with these young kids, these Haskell babies, I mean, we've got children who are, um, you know, young primary school age by our view today. Uh, some of them maybe even pre-K. Um, it demonstrates the thinking behind these schools to get these children at a very young age and to keep them away keep them separated from home, from parents, from culture. And for many of these students coming into the halls of these boarding schools, um, you know, they would be there four or five, sometimes seven, eight years uh, without ever going home. Um, this picture also, I think, is a pretty good indicator of what some of the legacies of the schools would be um, if you keep young children away from home and family and language and culture and tradition um, for an extended period of time in a very cold institutional environment uh, where they really are not being given any kind of um, nurturing or love, um, that's going to have um, some pretty deep running effects uh, in terms of what happens when those kids grow up and become parents themselves. So the thinking uh, in 
Pratt's motto, kill the Indian to save the man, um, is really dramatized to me in a picture like this um, because well, it speaks a thousand words, right? Besides the institutional environment and the um, unfamiliar things that students were being asked to uh, learn or abide by. Um, boarding schools also had the very unfortunate um, effect of of um, being places that were centers of um, epidemics of disease and consequently of death. Um, the Haskell Cemetery looks a little different than this today, uh, but not much. Um, it's a again, uh, a very powerful reminder of where the school came from. Uh, these are headstones of students, most of them from the late 19th century, but um, some of them um, as recent as about the era of the Second World War, you know, who made the ultimate sacrifice. Um, they never got to go home. And they're just a fraction of the children who actually died at Haskell uh, because many of them were sent home. Many of them were sent home while they were still ill so that superintendents didn't have to make reports that had high numbers of deaths that would reflect poorly on them. Um, I want to pause here for a second and make a point that I think is really critical. Uh, when we think about children being separated from parents or vice versa, families being broken apart, uh, when we think about young people who are being put into institutions uh, that are shaped by cultural mores and standards and behaviors that are by and large unfamiliar to them, uh, where they're being punished, um, for speaking their own languages, even if they don't know a word of English, um, and, and capital punishment, or excuse me, capital, excuse me, corporate, corporal punishment is very um, uh, much the rule of the day. Um, and that's pretty different than traditional Indian society. When we hear about the haircuts and the name changes and all of these things that constitute an assault on identity, it's pretty easy for our minds to say, oh, you know, these these poor kids, these poor people. Um, and, and, and you're right. I mean, there's a lot of awfulness to this. But I think it's also important to see them as more than just victims. Um, because um, even though things like compulsory education laws would come along, um, or there were unscrupulous means by which children got to school. Um, there are also a number of children and parents um, who came or sent their children willingly. Um, and that I think too is part of a very tribal way of thinking. If the reservations are really desperate places and there really is no chance um, to make a brighter future, this re-education is one of those few opportunities. And so sometimes, um, as hard as that decision might be, you know, parents allowed their children to come to schools like these, or they um, sent them there, you know, hoping for the best, maybe not understanding exactly what was taking place. Um, you know, or they saw it as, as you know, a, a way for their people to continue to live on. And that's a very tribal value, sacrifice. And so I think um, when I said the ultimate sacrifice, that's true. Um, but even for the ones who, the survivors um, who were there for those four, five or eight years, um, it, it was a kind of a, an enduring sacrifice that the thought was, we're doing this uh, to make things better and we will come back home and we will apply what we have learned uh, to make a better future. So I just want to draw that distinction because um, it's pretty easy to 
to just see it as as, as victimization. Um, and although there there are a lot of horrible things that went on, um, I want to I want to allow some understanding of that historical agency on the part of students and and families as well. So um, students at the schools. Um, and this is pretty much across the board on the, these non-reservation institutions. Um, they spent half the day in the classroom. And what they learned in the early years was pretty basic. It was a pretty rudimentary education. Um, what used to be called the three R's, right? Reading, writing, arithmetic. Um, so they're learning how to speak and write in English. Um, they are um, getting some basic instruction you know, perhaps in, in, in arithmetic, you know, basic math, uh, perhaps geography. Um, increasingly, what comes to be known in the words of, of Indian Commissioner Thomas Jefferson Morgan, uh, patriotic citizenship. Um, so they're being inculcated um, into uh, learning the names of the presidents, maybe state capitals, um, national holidays. Um, things like that, that, you know, maybe have a pretty limited application uh, after uh, they leave school. The other half of the day, they are hard at work. And so the next series of slides I'm going to show you, um, again, um, from about the mid-1890s, um, uh, give you some sense of that. Um, the biggest industrial pursuit, I'll use that term loosely, uh, was the farm, um, the agricultural crew. Uh, and that was all boys. Um, and again, here you see in this picture, all boys. Things are structured around um, Western gender lines. And this would be another one of those kind of unforeseen uh, ironies or consequences of a boarding school education. Um, native cultures, many of them have very um, different kinds of views of um, labor and gender association. Uh, so uh, if you're a Pawnee boy or um, an Oneida boy uh, and you're on the farm crew, you would be doing work that was traditionally designated as that that was um, reserved for women. And that was not meant to be um, a slight. It wasn't a, a denigration, um, but rather associated with spiritual beliefs. Women in those tribes and others were responsible for uh, agriculture as um, part of the belief system about women's power to reproduce. And women reaped the economic benefits of farming. So because the administrators and the bureaucrats who uh, ran these schools had no interest whatsoever in knowing about Native cultures, that's something that they, you know, they didn't even understand and, and probably, frank, quite frankly, didn't, wouldn't care to. Um, but in these uh, institutions, the gendered labor divisions, uh, of course, reflect Western culture. So the boys have a, a tailor shop or the young men in this case, uh, girls would have a sewing room uh, because uh, girls were very much being um, educated or re-educated as um, having a place in the domestic sphere. And that's about it. Um, just a few more pictures of shops. Um, this is the 1890s, and you can see in the paint shop, they're painting a wagon. Um, by the 18, mid-1890s, the state of Kansas has already had multiple automobile accidents, so there may be some question as to the uh, the wisdom or the utility of um, focusing on things like blacksmithing and wagon making, et cetera. It may not be um, skills that are going to uh, equip one uh, very well into the far future. Um, Sloyd is um, an interesting thing. It's a it's a method of teaching rather than a, a skill or a craft. Um, 
if you have a question about that, we can address it later. Just using it to illustrate these um, activities, you know, that students are doing that's taking up uh, about half of their day. And I should also point out in, in thinking about the farm, in looking at the wagon shop, paint shop, and you know, others, um, they're very much geared towards self-sustenance of the schools. Um, because the dominant thinking in American society at this time remains one that is very biased against Indians, um, because there are a lot of people outside of the reformers who are operating either within the halls of government or who are influencing policy. Um, you know, there, there's a hue and cry out there. Why are, why are we paying to educate Indians? And therefore, the amount of money that's allocated to the schools is pretty paltry. Um, even the first students who came to Haskell who were transferred from the Chilaco school um, were sent um, initially to help with building the school. I mean, they weren't architects, they weren't masons, um, but they were helpers. And students were continually doing the daily work of the school. So they're grading the walkways, you know, they're whitewashing the, the, um, um, the walls, they're um, building and mending fences. Um, the farm is growing the food that's being served to the students at the school. Whatever's left over, and that's a good bit of it, is being sold on the open market to go back into the coffers of the institution. The tailor shop is, you know, mending those uniforms and darning socks and, you know, doing the um, the things to keep the, the clothes that the students are wearing in fit repair. And the same is true, you know, of these other shops. They're really geared less towards, at least in the early days, uh, a sustainable lifelong skill than to um, you know, minimize the cost to the government of um, actually running these institutions. Uh, I kind of want to return to that thought of historical agency and looking at the next couple of slides. And I know my time is, is running down, um, but I don't have too many more. And then we'll have time for some questions or comments. Um, if something happens at Haskell by the mid 1890s, that's that's pretty unique. And um, partly that's because Haskell is growing um, so quickly. Uh, it grows from uh, just a, a, a few dozen students in its first school year to um, almost 500 within a year or two. Um, by the close of the 19th century, it's rivaling Carlisle in size, and by 1910, it's surpassed it. It's become the largest Indian school in the nation. Um, regardless of the ways that Native children get to school, whether it's through compulsion um, or um, some unscrupulous methods or through superintendent or excuse me agents filling quotas or or whatnot there is at some point um a need to recognize you have to have the goodwill of indian people to fill the schools and i think that became pretty clear at haskell um, fairly early and it maybe is not something that's apparent but you know, in my own research i really try to make the case that it's Indian young people and their families and their support networks, their communities, who are beginning to shape the nature of the schools. It's a slow evolution, but they do have a pretty discernible hand in that. Um, so if you're thinking about those last few slides, um, I think there is a rising um, voice and some pushback and saying, you know, um, we really don't need um, you know, people who just know how to do menial or manual labor. Um, the reservations are pretty bleak. We need um, economic stimulation. You know, we need uh, people who know business. We need accountants. We need bookkeepers to make sure we're not getting ripped off. 
We need nurses. We need doctors. We need lawyers. And so um, this is a class that, um, and again, it's a really powerful picture, I think, um, in shorthand at, at Haskell, um, because there begins to develop, um, you know, 10, 12 years after the foundation of the school, um, a commercial department, we would call a business school today, and a, um, a teaching program. And this picture is one where you see it is um, gender integrated, it's co-ed, uh, and that's pretty different than how things um, um, had uh, normally been at the school. Um, and um, it's a little bit of trivia here. First uh, touch typing class in the state of Kansas was taught at Haskell Institute. Um, and here's a picture from that um, that normal school. That's the old timey word for education. Um, both of these programs, I think, are uh, good evidence of a response uh, by the government to uh, the needs of Indian people as the Indian people themselves see them. Um, they don't last very long. They are quite experimental. Um, but they'll come back after a while. And I think, again, that's um, that's good evidence that um, Native people do have a hand in this. They do have historical agency. It's limited because it's in a very um, institutional environment that they don't run. Um, but it's one in which they do have some influence. And, and over time, they will exert greater and greater influence. Um, commercial department. Mostly young men, but I think I see at least one female there. Um, I always hope when I see this picture that, uh, you know, it's kind of like a student teaching um, um, exercise. And I always hope that, you know, maybe some of those those teachers who themselves were products of this education are helping some of those younger ones to to navigate and to mitigate, um, you know, what had what was a pretty harsh environment um i just want to kind of leave with sports and i could you could do a whole thing on sports at haskell um and at the indian schools pratt was really dead set against letting his um, boys play football um but they convinced him and then of course the old master pr that he was he uh he pretty quickly found a way to um capitalize on that uh, and football would come to haskell and other indian schools as well but it's kansas so i figured i had to put basketball first um and um baseball all american game right there's the haskell nine and um there they are posed in front of the gazebo which you can see in some of those older pictures that panoramic shot it's still there obviously it's been um you know uh, renovated a few times uh football Jim Thorpe, I think, is a name most people still recognize. Jim Thorpe is usually associated with Carlisle. Um, he did play there um, as a as a very a well known um, young man um, on the football team. Um, but Haskell had him first, and and I always have to point that out. He actually came to Haskell um, before he went on to um, be educated at, at Carlisle. Um, Haskell graduating class, 1890s. Um, again, you see some remnants of the kind of military surplus uniforms on the young men. Um, they're very much in keeping uh, with Victorian standards of dress, particularly with a couple of young ladies who are there. Um, and the point I'm trying to make is, I, I, you know, maybe there's not that much other than skin tone. You know, maybe there's not that much difference in a picture here uh, compared to other graduating classes of the time. Um, now, of course, Haskell is not a it's not a college. It's not even a high school at this point. Um, it's it's just moving into being a high school in the 1920s when Haskell emerges as a, a powerhouse football team. You know, and they're playing against KU and MU and Bucknell and Notre Dame and and beating them. You know, these are like um, high school age boys um, playing against um, college age men. And um, so this, you know, seeing a graduating class, I mean, it may be a bit deceptive. It's, it's you know, 
not even a high school yet at this point. So the graduation is a graduation of, of somewhat limited means, I would say, but an accomplishment nonetheless. Um, this picture, I'll, I'll be one of the last um, in this presentation, and I could do a whole lot about William Pollock. He's a really fascinating character, but I think the takeaway here can be, um, and, it, and it relates to that graduating class picture too. Um, on the left, you see this guy that William Pollock called his father, it wasn't his biological father, but you know, the thinking behind Haskell and Carlisle and those um, those non-reservation industrial boarding schools um, was that that's the past and that will be left behind. And then William Pollock over there on the right uh, that's that's the Indian of the future, the present and the future. But um, looking at um, natives who have had their hair cut uh, and replaced traditional dress with um, that that reflects the standards, white standards of the era, you know, is deceptive as well. It's not um, it's not so easy. It's not so cut and dried. Um, the hope that Pratt and others had would that this would solve things once and for all. Indians would become assimilated and integrated and leave those cultures behind. Um, and of course the boarding schools dealt many heavy blows and they have a lot of lasting legacies that uh, are negative. Um, but in the end they failed and um, native people are still here, native cultures, have survived. They've taken some heavy hits in terms of language, ceremony, family dynamics, and other things. Um, but the schools failed ultimately. And um, students at Haskell today, which is pretty much the polar opposite of what it was when it was established, you know, are engaging in the, the recognition, the celebration, um, the uh, revitalization of their histories, their heritage, their languages, their customs, and their cultures. So I'll just leave you with that picture of one of my former students in his traditional regalia at one of our powwows. And it's kind of this bridging two worlds idea. Haskell is a place, you know, that is now a university, and we're um, at least in the American Indian Studies program where I teach, you know, trying to indigenize the curriculum at every turn. Uh, but we're also offering, you know, degrees uh, that uh, are akin to, to other colleges and universities across the nation. So um, I know there's probably a lot I left out. So that means hopefully you have some questions. Um, but I'll leave my remarks there. And um, thank you for listening. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. We have had a couple questions come in. Uh, start with, did most students return to the reservation after graduation or uh, did they incorporate into the Western world? Yeah, um, you know, there's so many schools and so many young people who went through them. And then you kind of magnify that by multiple generations um it's a hard question to answer definitively but i would say um yes most of them did go home um to pratt that would have been the ultimate betrayal um because um he and others who thought the way he did um thought that those those kids would never want to go back and somehow the lights light bulbs would go off scales would fall from their eyes and they would want to be part of this, you know, great civilization of the West. Um, but you can imagine for students who've been separated from families for a long time, you know, there would be an impulse to go home. And I think for a number of them, they never forgot about home. You know, they always intended to go back. So I'd say the great majority did. Now, um, what did they find there? Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, pretty sad results. Um, if you've been separated from your family for, um, a period of years, um, you know, you, you may have lost the language, you've lost touch with the culture, you may not be able to communicate with your grandparents or parents anymore. Um, you may be seen as a little bit of, um, you know, a stranger or an outsider 
um, by some as well. Um, this 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 educated Indian. Um, so while I think most did go home and probably the majority remained on or near reservations, um, there are many cases of of others who um, you know did uh, go out into the wider world um, and and try and integrate themselves that way um, with different measures of success. For the ones who did return to the reservations and to their families, was there any organized attempt to undo the anglicization, sorry, anglicization uh, of what they went through at the schools? Yeah, I'm focused on that word organized. Mm -hmm. um, that may be very loosely. Um, I think there was an impulse uh, among many of the boarding school graduates or survivors, however you want to characterize them, um, to reintegrate back into um, Native ways and traditions, to relearn language, to um, refamiliarize themselves with uh, customs and culture and, and family dynamics and things like that. Um, the best kind of organized example I can give you um, is the Society of American Indians, which was founded in the uh, that that progressive era of when the NAACP and other groups were kind of um, coming around. Uh, 1911, um, a number of leading lights in Indian country, almost all of whom were products of boarding schools or Western education in some way, uh, founded this group um, to advocate for um, new, different, better, improved um, Indian policies. And one of the biggest things they focused on was the schools, um, because even though they had um, gone through that process and in many ways one could say had benefited by it, um, almost to a person, I think they felt lost and they really felt as that they had missed so much of their culture in that process. So people like um, Charles Eastman and um, Gertrude Bonin, um, Laura Kellogg, Carlos Montezuma, um, they all were educated in Western schools, um, but I think almost all of them found an emptiness that remained through that education and and they all became very involved not only as vocal critics of the the federal system but also in trying to personally reconnect um, with their um, families their cultures and, and so forth so that's like maybe the best example i can give um you know there may have been efforts on, on specific reservations um but that sounds like a great dissertation or book that someone has yet to write here we go uh, so in the picture that you had of the Haskell babies, uh, mm -hmm. some of the children did not look to be Native. Uh, mm -hmm. Were there ever white children educated along with the Indians in order to be like model students? Yeah, it's, it's a good point because I think that we have a tendency to look at um, the skin tone and associate it with um, different cultures or races. Um you, you, you know, you got to realize in, you know, 400 years of colonization and all of the intermarriage and things that took place, um, some of those students are not going to appear like a storybook Indian or an Indian that we're accustomed perhaps to seeing in a Western movie or something. Um, it's a good point to raise because, um, you know, at Haskell, um, I see every skin tone. I see every hair color, eye color. Um, you know, that's a cross section of Indian country because we we regularly have over 100 different nations represented. Um, you know, people are often surprised when they you know hear that, that I'm a citizen of an Indian nation um, because I don't look like what they think an Indian might look like. So I would say you're right. A lot of those kids in that picture, you know, um, have lighter skin tone. Um, they may have been um, products of families, you know, where one parent was white and wanted them to go to the school. Um, you know, I don't know each of their individual stories, but um, to, to answer the second part of the question, um, not in 
intentionally was it ever a school for white students, but that's a kind of a sticky wicket because um, identification along ideas like blood quantum, um, you know, may not tell the whole story of identity, um, you know, of who you are culturally. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, to, it, it always has been a school for Indians, you know, however that's configured, however that's designated. Uh, and that continues today. You have to be a member of, member of a federally recognized tribe to attend Haskell. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, how does the assimilation here compare with similar attitudes, such as in Australia and the Stolen Generation? Yeah, yeah. Um, great question, too. Um, so I um, just got done with classes last week, and I just I, I rolled out a class called the boarding school experience last year and just taught it for the second time. And one of the aspects of that class that I really want to um, impress upon students is how these colonial tendencies to assimilate uh, indigenous people was not isolated to um, North America or the United States. I mean, obviously, um, we have the residential schools in Canada, which pretty closely mirror the boarding school system here. Um, in the U.S., but uh, yeah, uh, Australia is one uh, where the um, the original or Aboriginal people were subjected to um, much the same kind of um, assimilationist and re-education policies. Um, if you've not seen it, there's a great film called The Rabbit Proof Fence that um, that uh, illustrates that pretty well. Um, I have a colleague um, uh, from Vietnam, and um, I've had her come in and do a lecture about, you know, what the French were doing uh, there. Um, and there's certainly some similarities. Um, there are even similarities in in um, in Eastern Europe um, in terms of, um, you know, like the um, the Russians and the uh, Germans um, promoting policies of assimilation over. Um, you know, other peoples, um, you know, living in what we think of as Europe or um, or adjacent areas. So, yeah, it's not a it's not a particularly American phenomenon, um, but I think the 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 tenacity uh, with which it um, remained in vogue uh, is perhaps more unusual, um, more noteworthy. Um, in the sense of its longevity than perhaps elsewhere. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we only have time for one more question. So we'll make it a very library question. Are okay. there any good resources you would recommend, books, movies, websites, to learn more about the history of the schools? Uh, yeah, so there's a Native American boarding school survivors network. Uh, I believe NABS is the acronym. Um, that's kind of the the place, um, I don't know what the best word for it is, clearinghouse, warehousing of information. Uh, it's not limited to just Native people. I mean, they, they love to have allies um, to, um, you know, raise awareness of, of this period of our history and and, um, you know, what's going on now, maybe with uh, Secretary Holland's initiative to, to get more transparency on the history and issues related to boarding schools. Um, there's a great, really sweet little movie, um, if you're looking for a, a film kind of approach called The Education of Little Tree, um, about a Cherokee boy and, and his upbringing in, in two very different types of um, educational um systems um i i can always recommend wholeheartedly david wallace adams book um education for extinction um, i think that's a great look uh, across the board at um at the re-education policies that were taking place in all kinds of different indian schools um and um in many different tribal communities um, over a pretty sweeping period of time. So those would kind of be three suggestions for getting at it in different ways. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, 
Yes, and thank you all for attending. And thank you to the Johnson County Library staff who helped make this program possible. Uh, our next The Past is Prologue program will be Thursday, January 25th, when journalist CJ Genovi will discuss her book, No Place Like Home, Lessons in Activism from LGBT Kansas. So thank you so much for attending tonight, and we hope to see you at our next program.